Welcome. This is Professor David Bishai from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I'll be speaking today about the pump handle from hell, Nightmare on Broad Street Still Stalks the Earth. First, an explanation of this whimsical title. This lecture was originally delivered in October of 2015 at the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences, and of course it was delivered during Halloween week. Second note of explanation is that from the title, one might get the idea that the nightmare that I'll be speaking about, since it has to do with pump handles and Broad Street, that the nightmare could be cholera. In fact, that's not correct. As you'll see in a few minutes, Yes, cholera is a nightmare, but there's a bigger nightmare, and it's uh, something rooted in how our responses to epidemics like cholera and even modern public health threats, uh, that our response is nightmarish. It keeps rec recurringly uh, insufficient to address the root causes of disease. Now, this lecture comes in four sections and the initially we will be speaking about the cholera epidemic and reflect a little bit about the nature of pump handles and whether they are simple problems or something more complex and we'll introduce the the idea of wicked problems and we can reflect on whether pump handles are simple or complex problems then we'll uh, broaden our discussion into how the history of public health has used community engagement as a tool to handle the more typical complex problems in public health. In the third section, we'll show applications to modern health problems. And in the final section, I'll be discussing a, a really recent approach known as collective impact, which has been used outside of public health, but is increasingly being used in public health as a, an organizing framework for the work we do uh, to be responsive to our disease burden. So let's launch right into Section A and go back to discuss the nature of pump handles. Of course, we want to begin at the beginning of the cholera epidemic. As far as the uh, historical reconstruction of this epidemic goes, the very first case may have been a newborn baby uh, does not have a first name known to history, and we'll simply refer to her as Baby Lewis. The epidemic uh, started on August 28, 1854, when this infant began to have uh, diarrhea and her mother began to rinse the diapers and dispose of the, the, the dirty water in her own basement where the cesspool was located uh, at 40 Broad Street. Unbeknownst to anybody at the time, the brickwork underneath Broad Street uh, was a direct connection from Mrs. Lewis's cesspool directly into the reservoir underneath Broad Street pump number three, just a few feet away uh, underneath the brickwork. The epidemic quickly spread on August 28th. Many, many cases fell ill uh, later that day and subsequent days. Baby Lewis wasn't the first to die, but she did succumb to her illness on September 2nd, 1854. Uh, early uh, in the epidemic, John Snow began to investigate the cases and to produce the data that was later reconstructed into the map you see, showing the highest caseload right around the Broad Street pump. On September 7, 1854, John Snow went to speak to the Parish Board of Guardians, and he uh, recommended the removal of the pump handle on the Broad Street pump. And indeed, on September 7th, the pump handle was removed, and then nothing happened to the epidemic. As you can see in this epidemic curve, uh, the first recorded cases in John Snow's data series were on the 31st of August, just three days after baby Lewis became ill. Uh, the peak caseload was on the 1st of September, followed by the 2nd of September, the day baby Lewis died, but the epidemic had begun to subside uh, following the death of, of baby Lewis. And subsequent case counts were lower. Uh, the day the pump handle was, was removed on the morning of 8th of September, uh, the case count had continued its decline to just 14 cases. and. Uh, the subsequent decline is shown on the graph. So really nothing happened in the historical progression of the cholera epidemic. 
However, baby Lewis's father got cholera on the 7th of September. And from all we can tell, if, if the pump handle had stayed on the pump, Father Lewis would have uh, had his stool also taken down to the cesspool in his basement, and the pump would have reemerged with a second wave of the epidemic. So indeed, it's quite possible that uh, this alternate version of history in the absence of Jon Snow could have led to a second uh, just as lethal epidemic. So nothing actually happened according to the epidemic curve, um, but in public health, it's always great when nothing happens, and, and this elimination of that second epidemic can fully be credited to Dr. Jon Snow's work. So Jon Snow deserves his place as a legend in public health. Uh, his demonstration of a waterborne source of cholera is one of the, the greatest achievements of uh, epidemiological research in history. And uh, his work um, is the foundation of epidemiology, and it's why so many people regard epidemiology as the queen science of public health. To commemorate Jon Snow's work, there are several, obviously, uh, 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 ways we remember him. But one really exciting way that he is commemorated is in the annual pump handle lecture that is given at the John Snow Society in London. This is an annual lecture given every September. Prominent alumni include uh, Johns Hopkins professor D.A. Henderson. Uh, luminaries such as Hans Rosling and Tom Frieden have also appeared to give the lecture. And in commemoration of John Snow, there's a ceremony before each lecture the speaker will remove the pump handle from an effigy of the Broad Street pump, and then ceremoniously, in a real surprise, the speaker puts the handle back on the pump. Because that's what really happened in history. Later in 1854, the pump handle must have returned to the pump because in early 1855, there are accounts of the pump handle being back on the pump. The people of London loved the taste of Broad Street pump water. It was celebrated throughout the city um, as being clean tasting. In the public mind, the concept of fecal oral transmission of polio was unthinkable. After all, the water from the pump did not taste like poop. And they, has n they had no common understanding of what a germ could be or how diseases could be caused by germs. So with the restoration of this pump handle and the, the preservation of pump handles throughout the city, cholera epidemics kept recurring in London. So here's a hero who is just as, des as much deserving of fame as Jon Snow, but I guarantee that very few have ever heard of Edwin Lancaster. Dr. Lanc Lancaster was the medical officer in this same neighborhood in the vestry of St. James. And following the 1854 epidemic, he devoted his career to campaigning person to person, uh, writing uh, to all who would listen about the need to close down shallow wells throughout this parish. There were repeated epidemics, and every time there was a cholera epidemic, Edwin Lancaster repeated his uh, cries that these shallow pumps should be closed down. And finally, after the 1866 cholera outbreak in London, the Broad Street pump was closed for good, and many other shallow wells were closed. And Lancaster's work was duplicated by many others in public health throughout these decades. And in the 1870s, the groundswell of interest in public health and understanding of uh, the role of shallow wells had emerged so that uh, one could build uh, a new sewer system and waterworks in London in the 1870s. So we have two heroes here. We have Jon Snow, who solved a simple problem of there being a contaminated well and removed the pump handle. And we have Edwin Lancaster, who solved a wicked problem, a complicated problem of a population that was not politically ready to take the necessary steps to protect its health. And so that begs the question, what are simple problems? What are wicked problems? And when will we encounter them? Well, simple problems are very linear in their causation. In a simple problem, the logic is if A, then B. And the contrapositive is also true. 
If not A, then not B. So the simple solution to the problem of B is to remove A, which is how Jon Snow solved the cholera problem. However, the problem facing Lancaster was a wicked problem. Wicked problems are changing over time. They have dynamic features and complex multifocal causation. There's no definitive way to write it down as A or B. There's no uh, requirement that stays uh, constant. And there's no consensus politically on what to do. Anything you do for a wicked problem is only partial, and each partial solution is going to create a counter-reaction that's going to create new problems. And so the diagram shows this tangled spaghetti web of possible outcomes, uh, showing that the problem is not going to stay solved. So, in one sense, the cholera epidemic was a simple problem, and yet in, the, in another sense, the cholera epidemic was a wicked problem. I submit to you that I think we remember the cholera epidemic more as a simple problem, and we think of epidemiology as a great way to get simple solutions. So I'd like you to just take a moment to reflect for a minute on areas in your own work that uh, might be simple problems or wicked problems. So please pause the lecture and write down on a piece of paper three simple problems that you're aware of in public health that are really simple uh, and three wicked problems in public health that are really wicked. And I'll return once you place, uh, press the pause button again. I want to go on now to talk about why there are so many wicked problems in public health. And my best explanation for this is a quote uh, from Adetokumbo Lucas. Dr. Lucas um, was having breakfast with me uh, back in 1997 in Geneva, and he leaned over and he said to me, public health is science in a value-rich environment. And I think this summarizes why there are so many wicked problems. The values are here. They're part of our work, and a value is going to change. It's going to be reflexive. It's going to respond to things that happen. Values are contagious. They spread from person to person, and they don't stay constant. So here's the thing about what we are doing in public health. We create a, a science basis, and we can do science about the biology of disease, but we have been very remiss in doing science about values. So here then is what I want to set as the foundation of this recurring nightmare in public health. The nightmare is mistaking the reality of wicked problems for just simple problems. And when we do this, we set up simple solutions and set up heroes who solve them again and again and again. And that's the nightmare that we need to address. So when we return for the next section, I want to talk a little bit about the, the history of what Lancaster did and show other examples of how community engagement is a way to get a good solution to wicked problems in public health.